Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I'm your host, pharmacist Eric Christensen, and I thank you so much for listening today. As always, go check out reallifepharmacology.com. We've got that free 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs. It's a great study guide, great review if you're out in practice or whether you're taking pharmacology courses. Uh, definitely going to help you highlight some of the most important things uh, from some of the most commonly used drugs. So uh, simply an email will get you access to that, and then we get you updates when we've got new podcasts and other content available as well. All right, the drug of the day today is methadone, and this medication is a synthetic long-acting opioid. The use of of this medication is going to be pain management, but probably more likely uh, you're going to see this in opioid use disorder. Mechanistically, this drug, as you can imagine, binds mu opioid receptors. uh, And in opioid use disorder, how that works is that ultimately uh, prevents withdrawal symptoms because one of the kind of characteristics of methadone is that it has a longer half-life compared to uh, some of the you know more immediate release opioids such as oxycodone and morphine. Uh, so again, it's going to prevent those withdrawal symptoms for uh, 24 hours, maybe even longer in some situations. Uh, it's going to reduce cravings for other opioids. Also helps to maintain tolerance. So in the event uh, that somebody who uses opioids uh, has a you know larger ingestion or they start using again, um, hopefully that tolerance is good enough to prevent an overdose situation. But again, uh, that all depends upon uh, you know consistency of administration uh, as well as how much opioids uh, the patient is taking and that sort of thing. Uh, in addition to that tolerance, it's also going to help Uh, reduce that euphoria, basically blunt the high of taking other, you know, higher dose illicit or maybe even non-illicit opioids. So if you remember um, buprenorphine, I did uh, talk about this medication before. Uh, So those are the two main drugs, methadone and uh, buprenorphine uh, used. And buprenorphine has partial agonist activity, Um, but it's not considered a full opioid uh, agonist like methadone is. Uh, A couple other things uh, to note here uh, with regards to opioid use disorder and uh, dosing. Um, In somebody that's, you know, pretty naive or their tolerance is very, very low, uh, that dosing might be 2.5, maybe up to 10 milligrams. Uh, In patients that are experiencing significant withdrawal, maybe they've had a higher uh, opioid use history in the past, maybe their tolerance is a little bit higher. Um, Some clinicians, depending upon the situation, may consider initiating uh, up to 20 to 30 milligrams once a day. So um, that starting dose really kind of depends upon um, the uh, clinician's decision and assessing kind of their past medical history. Uh, Dosage forms, uh, there's an oral tablet, there's an oral solution, uh, there's also injectable formulations of methadone. Uh, With methadone, uh, conversion may come up, and I've had to address it once or twice, I think probably in my career, thank goodness not too many more times than that. Um, But methadone conversion is very tricky in that uh, it is much less simple than some of the other opioids as far as conversion goes. And, um, you know, I I don't want to, you know, give you the idea that, you know, conversions are always easy and perfect because they're not. You definitely need to monitor patients whenever you're switching from one medication to another. And there's a lot of factors that can go into that and why they may or may not respond, whether it's um, adherence or pharmacogenomic changes or anything like that. Um, but methadone is especially tricky uh, when it comes to uh, conversion. So uh, my first and foremost recommendation is if you try to convert methadone to another opioid, let's say in pain management, for example, um, my first recommendation is to not do it if you can do it. 
Um, and then if it does have to be done, uh, I'm not going to go through the whole conversion, um, you know, process here. Um, but in general, uh, the higher the morphine equivalent, uh, the lower the percentage of methadone is uh, the conversion. So for example, if you've got somebody that's um, less than 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent uh, per day, uh, you might consider a conversion in the neighborhood of, you know, 20 to 30 percent. Now, if you've got somebody that's on, you know, ridiculously high doses of morphine equivalent, let's say upward 600 to 1,000, um, you may be at 10 percent or maybe even less uh, than 5 percent. Again, depending upon uh, how high that dose is and uh, what the, the plan is for conversion there. So um, regardless, uh, definitely if you're going to convert somebody from, uh, methadone to something else or vice versa, um, pay really close attention and that clinical monitoring is going to be very, very uh, critical uh, to ensure that we don't put these patients into uh, an overdose uh, toxicity type situation. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, adverse effects. And first, I want to start with box warnings. So, uh, it is a Schedule II controlled substance, uh, risk for addiction, dependence. Um, avoid the use of benzodiazepines if possible. Uh, that can increase the risk of respiratory depression. Uh, there's also a boxed warning on uh, medication errors regarding oral solution. Um, so paying attention to that if we're using that and making sure we're doing our math correctly. Uh, verifying, double-checking, and all that good stuff. Uh, QTC prolongation. So this is a little bit more of a unique one with methadone compared to other opioids. It does increase the risk for QTC prolongation. Um, I'll talk about many other drugs um, in the interaction uh, section uh, that can increase that risk. Um, 450 is kind of a, a, a number that uh, is thrown out where if you've got a patient that is at baseline of uh, QTC uh, interval above 450. That's a patient you're probably going to worry about a little bit more. Uh, if they're above 500, you're really, really going to worry and probably um, avoid methadone altogether if possible uh, and or assess other medication and risk factors too um, if that QT uh, interval gets too long there. So that QTC prolongation risk with methadone ultimately can lead to uh, torsades, which is obviously a significant um, negative cardiac outcome there. Uh, the other boxed warning that's kind of unique with methadone is uh, there's a bunch of CYP P450 interactions. So CYP 3A4, uh, 2C9, 2D6, 2C19, 2B6, as in, B as in boy, uh, and inhibitors of any any or all those enzymes can raise concentrations significantly. So that is definitely a really, really important thing to remember with methadone. If you've got a polypharmacy patient, you know, they're taking 5, 10 or more meds, there's a pretty good chance that you're probably going to run into some drug interactions, uh, and you better be aware of that for sure. Uh, other adverse effects, obviously, you know, some of the common opioid adverse effects, sedation, constipation, uh, respiratory depression, as, you know, doses escalate or we get into that overdose type situation, uh, can drop blood pressure at times, uh, reduce libido, uh, hyperalgesia is possible as well. Uh, patients at risk for adverse effects, uh, naturally, it's probably the, the usual cast of characters there. Um, you know, frail, elderly, um, not in great health. Uh, and then, you know, obviously a lot of those polypharmacy patients where drug interactions can um, cause methadone concentrations to go up as well. Um, those are all situations where uh, signs and symptoms of toxicity may be more likely in, in that t those type of patient populations. All right, let's talk kinetics a little bit. Uh, onset of action for pain management is in that 30 to 60 minute range uh, with, you know, four to 12 hour duration, depending upon, you know, if you just give a single dose, it might only be, you know, four to six, maybe up to eight hours of, of uh, duration of action. With repeated dosing, you may get a little bit 
uh, of an extension there. Uh, Half-life can range quite a bit depending upon the the patient. So for instance, in um, pregnancy, uh, there's actually an increase in CYP3A4 uh, enzyme action, and this can actually lower concentrations or remove it more quickly uh, from the body, deactivate it more quickly. Um, so in pregnancy, you may see um, a half-life down around the eight-hour mark versus, you know, frail elderly patient. Um, that half-life can be, you know, day, maybe even two or even close to three days in some situations. So uh, that half-life can vary a little bit, but it's definitely considered uh, a long-acting uh, opioid for sure uh, compared to some of the other uh, agents in that, that category. Uh, monitoring parameters, I think that's probably pretty straightforward. Respiratory rate, for example, um, QTC prolongation, so naturally we're going to monitor that, uh, particularly if we have uh, other concerns or patients at risk for QTC prolongation. Uh, a couple of patient education points uh, that, that need to be made. Certainly, um, naloxone access uh, should, could be considered, and that should be a discussion certainly with your, your patient. It is a full opioid agonist, so that is um, a risk, certainly. Um, with uh, the use of methadone. And then, of course, withdrawal, recognizing that if patients stop taking this medication abruptly uh, without tapering down, they're going to experience some significant or can experience some significant uh, withdrawal symptoms there. All right, let's take a quick break from our sponsor and we'll wrap up with drug interactions. If you're on the market for any pharmacist board certification study material like ambulatory care, BCPS, NAPLEX, BCMTMS, or the geriatric exam, go check out meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. We've got a great list of resources there. We've helped thousands of pharmacists pass their board exams, uh, and uh, we believe we can certainly help you do that as well. So again, all those links at meded101.com slash store. Uh, If you're a nurse, med student, PA, uh, we've got a lot of other resources there as well. Lots of books on Amazon, Audible books, uh, plenty of interesting materials on case studies, drug interactions, drug food interactions, uh, lots of good stuff that you can all find at meded101.com slash store. All right, let's wrap up methadone with drug interactions. So first and foremost, I want to mention QTC prolongation, um, antipsychotics, uh, citalopram, azithromycin, amiodarone. These can all increase QTC prolongation risk. Another drug interaction to be aware of, benzodiazepines, increase the risk for CNS depression, respiratory depression, uh, and generally overdose uh, in general there. Uh, MAOIs uh, have significant serotonergic activity and are actually contraindicated with the use of methadone. Uh, Naltrexone, so many patients who are being managed for opioid use disorder may also have issues with alcohol or alcohol use disorder. And naltrexone is a significant option in the management of alcohol use disorder. So naltrexone is an opioid antagonist, so that is going to directly oppose uh, the action of methadone. So that is an important one to remember if you've got kind of polysubstance use and we're using uh, naltrexone for some reason there. Uh, And then last uh, but not least, I certainly wanted to mention all those CYP enzymes Uh, 3A4, 2B6, 2C9, 2D6, 2C19. So if we have inhibitors at any of those enzymes, it could raise the concentrations of methadone and increase the action and increase the likelihood for toxicity. Uh, CYP3A4 is probably the most prominent one um, just because there are probably a lot more interactions there too. Um, Grapefruit juice, for example, inhibits CYP3A4. Um, amiodarone, deltiazem, uh, azole antifungals, uh, some of the macrolide antibiotics like clarithromycin and erythromycin. Uh, So we've got plenty of medications there uh, that can inhibit CYP3A4 and actually increase concentrations of methadone. 
Uh, and then last but not least, I did want to mention inducers. Um, you know, carbamazepine, phenytoin, rifampin. And in addition to just thinking about starting these medications, which would ultimately lower the effect of methadone, uh, if you've got a patient stabilized on methadone, and then you take away one of these enzyme inducers, it could cause concentrations to go up and increase the risk of toxicity. So um, really, really critical to recognize that point, that uh, interactions don't just happen when you start a medication, but they also can happen when you stop a medication as well. So it's important to recognize uh, the potential ramifications from any changes uh, in medication in general. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the podcast for today. Hopefully you picked up a few practice pearls. I thank you so much for listening. If you want to contact me, you can do so at mededucation101 at gmail.com. Uh, please support the sponsor, meded101.com slash store. Any purchases there from those links go directly to support this podcast. Uh, and as always, share us with your friends, colleagues, listservs, uh, whatever the case may be, anyone who's looking to uh, pick up some more education on pharmacology, uh, you guys have made this podcast grow uh, to greater amounts than I, I had ever anticipated. So I greatly appreciate that. And if you find this podcast uh, beneficial, I definitely uh, would appreciate you sharing that further and uh, passing it along. With that, I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.